Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Paul Artali. I am a program manager here at the Rackham Graduate School, and we are going to be talking taxes today with uh, Ed Jennings, who is our, our tax guru here at, at the University of Michigan. Before we, I turn it over to Ed, a couple of things. Number one, this session will be recorded, so uh, the camera will be on Ed and I, but know that it's recorded, so if we ever op if we open up the mics, uh, you could be recorded, but this, with that, this session will also be available after, a few days after all of this, uh, if you want to review the materials. Also, the PowerPoint will also be available to everyone uh, who registered for this event. And if during this talk, you have questions, throw them into your chat room, uh, into the chat box, and we will do our best to answer them during the presentation. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Ed Jennings to talk about taxes. Ed, how are you doing today? Good, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, greetings, folks, and I hope you had a great 4th of July holiday. Um, a day off is always good. Um, as Paul mentioned, uh, we've got a PowerPoint here. We've only got an hour. This typically takes two hours. So uh, we will be hitting highlights. That's why they're, they're, it's recorded and you'll have access to this. It has some case studies, and they're really the points we're trying to make. Um, uh, let's see. So, a uh, couple of issues. Uh, now, Paul, is there any way I can get access to the document? So, the uh, the slides. Yes. Uh, do you have them on your computer, or I can share? I can share my screen, and people can see them. Well, I have. Uh, maybe it's my uh, view. Uh, I'm doing a speaker view. So, yeah. Let's do sh share screen. Go ahead. Okay. Can you put on the share screen and have me work it off that? That'd be great. All right, just tell me when you want me to advance the slides. Uh, oh, no, 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 I, all right, go ahead then. You're gonna, okay, sorry. All right, we're good. Otherwise, you have to share it from your end, Ed. You can just- Is that what I have to do? Yeah, I can, you wanna try that? Yeah, let me try that. All right, once well, again, so, people, sorry, go ahead, Ed. go ahead. No. Uh, I'm just saying, folks, uh, if you have any tax questions as we're getting set up here, oh, here we go. Uh, again, make sure to throw them into the chat box and I will monitor them and ask Ed as we get along. Ed, you're, you're on now, man, so we're good to go. Yep, good, all righty. So thanks folks, I appreciate you dealing with my technical inabilities, which has been a lifetime struggle. Um, so one of the things we do is we wanna go through and talk about basically what you're looking at a lot of times, taxation of scholarships or fellowships. But in order to do that, we have to put that into the bigger picture. Uh, and the agenda basically talks a lot about that. We talk about this on a, we have a lot of questions, but there are certain main questions that you're really going to have that we'd like to give you answers to. Um, which is basically, do I have a tax liability? The answer is probably yes. If you received a cash stipend, chances are most likely you're gonna have a tax liability. Well, if I do, then how much will that be? And we'll talk about that and how much it can actually be and what you have to do. Uh, and then you say, well, okay, fine, but then how do I report it? How do I pay it? And that'll be something very important because uh, this is unlike with wages or anything else that you've had, the responsibility to pay it is on you, not your employer. And then to whom? And we have federal and state. Um, you know, I don't know why we had a tea party because you're going to find we're paying more taxes to more people than ever before. But if you look at the agenda, the very piece we're going to talk about is some of the universal concepts on taxation. And that's looking at it from a federal perspective. Near the bottom of the agenda, we do talk about the state issues and the states tend to file the Fed. Um, part of what we're going to talk about as we go through this is how you're expected to make the payments. So you'll see down there the one of the bullet points we have near the bottom. Uh, is the quarterly estimated tax payments. It'll be one of the bigger struggles. Um, so you're gonna have to pay this in throughout the year. and We'll talk some about that. Um, and then there are some forms that you then will file uh, on your behalf, and then you don't have to worry about that. So please know where you are as to whether you're a GSI, GSRA, or uh, you've actually received a scholarship. All has different treatment. As we go through this, one of the ma major points we try to make a distinction on too are residents, uh, US residents, uh, domestic students, and um, or domestic citizens and uh, resident aliens. They're all viewed as uh, US citizens and they file a tax return and the concepts apply to them differently than if you're what we call non-resident alien, meaning uh, as defined by the Internal Revenue Code, you are from a, your foreign birth, uh, foreign born, and that you haven't been here in the US long enough to be treated as a US citizen and there are certain advantages to that. Um, and that's basically the big picture as we go through this. Uh, I do have one caveat, which is, as the tax director here, and it's, I've done this for 22 years, we don't actually get into uh, answering specific questions. So you can't email me later on. 
Uh, there's an insurance risk issue that we're not allowed to answer individual questions or provide advice to individuals, including President Slissel. So just letting you know, that's basically the situation. That's why we have this set up, so you get this educational format. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to address your questions as we go. Something Paul mentioned, make sure you keep us uh, in the loop with, through the chat session. Um, first slide, probably most important is humor. Uh, do realize when you're going through tax, it's very dry. Um, once you get comfortable with it, it gets a little better, but basically it can uh, tell. And this is Snoopy, and it's one of my favorite things. I can tell you uh, it's not gonna work, um, but it, it's a nice try. Tax purposes. This slide is very important because it has certain concepts. Now, Paul, as we go through, if you have any questions, feel free to interject. Folks, again, it's usually a two-hour session. We only have an hour, so we're going to highlight this. But this slide is very important because it talks about some of the universal concepts. Um, as we go through one, individuals. Taxpayers aren't just people. It's corporations, estates, trusts, anybody and everybody who makes a dollar. The, the, uh, Congress will make sure that they're going to tax you. They created a code, the Internal Revenue Code, that has a slew of rules, and those rules are basically going to make sure that they tax any and all income that they can. Income is broadly defined, um, and there's two types of income. There's or two types of taxes. There's an income tax regime and a Social Security tax regime. Income is on the accretion of wealth. So if you earn money, um, interest, dividends, whatever you have, cap gains or wages, they're going to tax that. There's an accretion of wealth. You're better off after you receive that money than you were before. There's also a uh, Social Security tax regime. That's really supposed to be a retirement program for you when you get later on in years. Uh, the way it works, though, is the, er, the current generation doing all the work is who affords the older folks. What I'm saying is you folks are going to afford my retirement, so thank you very much. As we go through this, we're going to be talking a lot about income, but not FICA, this is to give you comfort. Uh, FICA is generally not going to apply, and you'll see that as we go. At the Fed rate, and then many states, you'll see this too, you have graduated tax rates, uh, which means, uh, and you hear people say that, oh, it bumped me up to a higher tax bracket. That's what happens. So the, the wealthier you are, the more tax you're paying on a percentage basis on that same dollar. Um, then we talk about uh, tax returns filed on a calendar year basis. Many people will say, is it 13 years or four? Is it 13 months, 14 months, it's one year. And it starts from January and ends in December. It's a calendar year basis for nearly all individual taxpayers. It's also on a cash basis. And that's very important because the question is, when did you actually receive the cash? So someone told you you were gonna win a million dollars in December 28th, and they didn't pay it to you until January 2nd. You don't have to put it on a return until the January 2nd year rather than the earlier year. Um, and then we talk about worldwide income. Now this is a concept uh, many countries have, the US per se, which is we're going to, the U.S. taxes you on income, whether you earn it in Ireland, I, uh, uh, in Mexico, or here in the U.S. If you're a U.S. citizen or a resident alien, we will tax you on that. And that's one of the differences with non-resident aliens. If you're a non-resident alien, you have your own country, and they may either tax you on worldwide income or may not. But the U.S. does not have the authorization or the jurisdiction to tax you on anything other than what you've earned here in the U.S. because you're not an a citizen of the country or a resident alien. Uh, and we'll see some of that. Do know most of this presentation will be talking a lot about um, resident aliens and U.S. citizens because of the difficulty that they have where, uh, in reporting and paying these amounts, whereas that's not necessarily the case for the non-resident aliens, what we call NRAs, and you'll see why as we go through this. So most of the presentation is geared, again, to U.S. citizens and uh, resident aliens. You also need, and this is the FICA concept, or the income tax, the quarterly estimated tax concept. You have to pay the tax as you go. A lot of people think you pay it next April. So 2019 ended and we would have to pay it April 15th. That's not the case. Actually, if you pay it as you go. You just don't see it a lot when you're doing wages because the employer is paying it for you. And that's one of the concepts and that's where that comes in with quarterly estimated tax payments. Um, uh, now, at this point in time, I think I want to stop and make a quick break. I said April 15th. For this year alone, because of COVID, uh, we've moved, the Congress and states have agreed to move the individual filing date up to July 15th, which is why we're having this in July. And typically, Paul and I are having this conversation in January, March, well, January, February, and March, uh, typically. Um, but today, we're actually going to do it uh, in July, uh, and that's the idea. This is just a schedule to show you the graduated brackets. And you can see that if you, 
if you're in the yeah, less than $9,700 and you're single, and you can see the different classifications, and then you're subject to tax at 10%. Uh, you get higher than that, the same dollar is now su subject to 12% rather than 10%. That's basically how it works. Um, now this form, or this slide, is basically gonna be talking about the actual um, payment structure. Uh, we talked about that. If you have a tax liability, you have to pay it. How do you pay it? Well, what we wanna let you know, very, very early in this presentation up front is, it may be a situation where someone's paying that tax in on your behalf, but if it's a scholarship fellowship, you do need to know that you're going to have to make these payments on your behalf throughout the year as you earn them. Uh, so you have a W-2. Anybody received a W-2 before, either from the University of Michigan or another employer, you're going to notice that when you get your paycheck at the end of the week, it's not the $100 they promised you. It's $60, some of which they've taken out for federal income tax, income, state income tax, the FICA tax, and so forth. So, but they've done the withhold for you. So come next April 15th, basically all you're filing is a, is a tax return that reconciles all that's been paid in to date with, with the actual tax that you end up having to pay. So that's the idea of a W-2. Uh, 1042S were for non-resident aliens. What we do there is we will tell you what the tax amount is and we'll do some withholds on it at a certain percentage. And again, some of your tax will be, have been paid in on your behalf. Now, 1099 is basically for, again, domestics and resident aliens. Uh, we don't tend to give NRAs a 1040 uh, or a 1099. But a 1099 will tell you what your taxable amount is, but we won't do withholds. Uh, we tend to use that with the uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. They're the accounting firm that comes in and gives us our accounting statement. Um, any kind of company or other kind of organizations that we work with, um, with, that we pay through our vendor system, we actually, if it's $600 or more, we have to give them a 1099. Uh, what's interesting here is if you're a student who's received a scholarship or fellowship, you're not gonna receive the W-2 or the 1099. And that's the distinction between the domestics and the, not, and the resident aliens versus the NRAs. Because the NRAs will receive a 1042S. On that 1042S, if they're in need, they will do withholdings. So the NRAs don't have to worry so much. They have less of an, a burden, if you will, as they go through the rest of this presentation because they don't have to worry about quarterly estimated tax payments necessarily because they are necessary. The, the payroll is actually doing a, a, a form for them and on that form, they're doing withholding for them. So they're reporting and withholding. That's not happening for the US citizens, the domestics or the resident aliens. No one's telling you what the amount is. No one's withholding anything on your behalf and you have to make the payments in on, on your own. So that's the point of this session, uh, really, as we go through it. Um, and uh, that's more or less as we go. Um, do know if you're a non-resident alien and you got a 1042S, and you might've gotten a W-2 if you're, uh, even if you're a US citizen um, or resident alien, if you were a GSI or GSIRA. Uh, so if that's the case, if you got a form from us, feel free to call those folks, <clears throat> excuse me, with a W-2, it's payroll, um, and uh, with a 1042S, it's payroll. Uh, if you got a 1099 for whatever reason, I can't imagine, that would be our payables office. But if you got a form from us, you can go back and talk to our folks and ask them why you got one, how it was determined, and so forth. But if you don't get a form, <clears throat> that's where the tax department's not in a position to actually give you any tax advice. You didn't get a form. So now I'm helping you do your form. We're not helping you with the form we issued. So that's the idea. Uh, and so the general rule on taxation it brings us back to the question, do I have a tax responsibility? And if so, how much? This slide answers that. You folks received a scholarship or a fellowship. Basically, what you've had is you've, your tuition has been paid for. you. You've also had a situation where we've given you stipends, which isn't defined in the code. But basically, someone's given you cash um, for you to live on. Um, you've already had your tuition paid. So in which case then, this is to help you live, to survive, uh, rent, um, food, and of course, beer. So uh, basically, that's the point of, of, of uh, um, stipend. So then, so what of that is taxable and what isn't? Well, everything is taxable in the Internal Revenue Code unless there's a code section to pull it out, to exclude it. And there is a code section, 117, that talks about qualified scholarship. It's not everything you've received, it's some of it. It basically covers tuition, and fees that are required as part of the curriculum. Well, the tuition basically has been waived for you. You don't have to pay it. We don't give you money and then you pay it back to us. 
it's been waived. But what's good is, good news is it's, it's an in-kind benefit, but it's not a taxable in-kind benefit. So it's not like we have to put it on a form for you or you have to put it on the return. Um, and then it comes down to uh, fees that are required as part of the curriculum. And that would include expenses that you have, like um, books that are required for the curriculum. So if you've got $1,000 of cash, that would be taxable. But if you spend 200 of it on books that are required as part of the curriculum, only 800 is taxable. Then that's how it works. And then the non-qualified scholarships is the rest of the stipend that doesn't meet qualified, and that would be your taxable income. So generally, cash stipends that you're getting that don't cover fees that are required as part of the curriculum will trigger taxable income. And again, I believe, and I've seen this throughout my 22 years, Nearly all these payments, and I've not seen a situation otherwise, but I always leave room for doubt, um, is that it should be excluded from FICA. It's not earned income. And it's very important. That's why you're not getting a W-2. You're not working for the University of Michigan. This is for the pursuit of education, furthering your knowledge. So basically a stipend, or I'm sorry, a scholarship should allow you to further your education. It should not be considered earned income, which is what's subject to FICA or self-employment tax. So when we talked about the two regimes, we're only going to be talking about income tax going forward, not necessarily FICA or supplement tax. Now, real quick, non-resident aliens, just because we've been making this distinction, keep in mind, um, if you're foreign born, you can be an NRA. In fact, you will be until you're here long enough. Uh, there are certain exceptions that can pull you out of that, and we tend to see that with students. The two most important distinctions between NRAs and uh, uh, domestics and resident aliens, is the fact that you're not taxed on your worldwide income, you're only going to be taxed on your, well, the interim code will not tax you on your worldwide income, it will only tax you on your U.S. sourced income. That may be just your scholarship or fellowship. Um, also, payroll issues a form, the 1042S, which we discussed, they will tell you how much of your non-qualified scholarships are, uh, what they are, they will define for you what the taxable amount is, and then they will do a withhold on you. So basically, if you're going to get 100 bucks a month, you will only get $86 a month. 14% has been withheld. So generally, you don't have to worry about quarterly estimated tax payments. So the good news is, as a non-resident alien, um, you, you don't have to worry as much about a tax burden as we will with the other students. Now, uh, uh, there are uh, this even more news, better news. I got good news for you and better news. So what was it? Something Harry Truman said, right? Nothing better than cake, but more cake. Uh, basically, you could also be excluded from taxation on your non-qualified scholarships under treaties, because treaties trump the code, the Internal Revenue Code. So it may be a situation where you don't have to pay that either. So um, again, you've got a form. It comes from payroll. So if you want to know more about it and you're an NRA, payroll will help you. Also, we have a very good active website with International Center, and they actually even have a um, software package that you can use free to be able to compute your own taxes and file your US tax return, the 1040 NR, NR for non-residents. Um, so generally, uh, uh, life is, is, is not as burdensome for the non-resident. So now we're up to a quick quiz, and this is going to help set up the rest of the presentation in talking about your tax return. So basically, this is what a tax return looks like, although uh, conceptually. You have income, and what they want is bring all your income in for the calendar year that we mentioned, uh, all your taxable income, and then you get to have deductions. And then after that, we figure your tax. Uh, and I'm using a 10% tax rate here. And then there are credits to the tax. So generally, you can even reduce the tax. So I can reduce my, my taxable, my, my revenues by deductions, and then I can reduce my tax by credits. It's a, it's a good world. Um, and the query is, would you rather have a $50 deduction or a $15 credit? Um, and as the facts work out, in this case, it's better to have the credit. And the, what the credit shows you is, even though it's less than dollars, uh, it offsets a smaller subset, which is your tax, so it's actually more valuable. Uh, tax is actually cash, that's the way to think of it, and credits actually give you cash, whereas deductions just help offset revenue, which arrives at tax. So that's basically how it works. And as you can see, as you go through here, $100 of revenue, with the deductions, you use $50. You have $50 of taxable income. You apply the 10% tax, $5. You don't have any credit, so you owe $5. Well, on the other, other column, under the credit column, you have $100 of revenue. You have no deductions, so you have, you have taxable income of 100. That's not as good as what was. 
but you do have a tax and the tax is ten dollars it's it's twice as high which makes sense but you get this fifty dollar credit so basically you don't have a tax if it's a non-refundable credit and if it's a refundable credit it's even more cake you get they pay you there's a nice situation of the government pay you that sets up the platform if i can real quickly for the 1098t now you folks may be receiving this form if you're tuition has been paid for completely by the University of Michigan, um, then generally you're not going to be able to use this form. It isn't a tax form in the sense it tells you about a taxable income. It's a tax form that tells you about a credit. That's why we went through this. It could also be a deduction if you want, depending upon your tax situation. But this is a good news tax form. The unfortunate news for domestics and resident uh, aliens is that if your scholarship, if your own scholarship and your education has been paid for by a third party, uh, then you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. And I can explain that real quick. Uh, here you basically have box one, and what gets offset by box one is box five. You see scholarship credits. So anything in box five is a contra account to one. So if one has a thousand and box five is two thousand, you have a negative thousand. You're not going to be able to take it. And that's basically what your 1098T is going to look like uh, if you were a, a full rider and you receive some stipends. Um, just to give you some background, the credit basically, as we mentioned, there's two, American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning. Lifetime Learning tends to work for graduate students, which tends to be most of the folks on the line. Um, it's basically a non-refundable credit, so it's not, nothing along those lines. But if you want to learn more about it, we have a web, a, a web link that'll tell you more about that. You may have received this form and you may want to know more about it. Um, when you receive that form, you then put it onto this form on your tax return. This takes the information we've given you and it narrowly tailors it to your personal tax situation. Um, and you can determine whether you're entitled to it or not. You can see there's phase outs and so forth. So if you make so much money, you're not gonna be entitled to it either. Um, and here is the, uh, what I like, and these are these uh, examples. And they come out of the IRS publications. It's very important because we've cited some IRS publications at the end of the presentation. They will help you to better understand a lot of the concepts we're going through. Uh, tax is a ripple effect. It's like throwing a, a, a pebble into, the, into a, a pond. Uh, you get these ripples. And uh, every time you hear something, you pick up a little bit more. And these are pictures provided by the, uh, I like pictures, uh, provided in publications uh, by the IRS. This is from 970. This is your major publication that you want to be looking at if you want to know about uh, your tax situation if you receive the scholarship deduction. And the second the bottom, the, the box, the second from the bottom, says, were the same expenses paid entirely with a tax-free scholarship grant? Uh, and the answer would be yes, then you can't use this. That would be for both credits, the American Opportunity and the Lifetime Learning. Same question, same issue. And the reason is you're not out of pocket. So if you're not out of pocket, you're not gonna be entitled to it. Um, and that's how it works. So again, the form seems like a good a cake form, right? It's good news. It talks about a credit, which we just went through as excellent. Bottom line is, chances are, if you've got a full ride, you're not gonna be entitled to that credit. So it's a form you're not gonna be able to use. But if you did pay for some of your education at any time during the year, you may be able to use this. Even if you paid for it in March or, or, or in the early term, January for the first term, and then the, the latter term, you ended up the fall term, you ended up getting a scholarship. Again, you're all within the calendar year. So you may be able to take the form for what you paid for, where you wouldn't be able to take the credit for the scholarship. So it all depends on your personal situation, but form to know about if you need to know. Now, IRS, uh, interesting. The chances of you being audited are doubled in the sense that they audit us, they audit you. Um, that said, the chance of you being audited is less than 1% of so, all. Hey, uh, yes. I had a couple questions here from the box. I thought that was a good time to ask them if that's okay. Sure. All right, quick question. Uh, Amanda asked if we received, because we're talking about the 1098T, if we received a Rackham Travel Fellowship included on the 1098T for research travel expenses, how do we report that? I would assume if it's on the 1098T, it doesn't need to be reported. Is that correct? Right. It's not income. It yep. doesn't say that form is not meant, and the IRS does not use it to determine what your taxable situation is. You're going to have to sit down and figure it out based on the formula that we have to fit, that anybody has to figure out, which is how much was your scholarship? What was used for part of the curriculum? Only you know what you spent that on. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's going to work. Yes. Gotcha. And Brian asks, uh, if he if he gets VA benefits from a parent who served through the GI Bill, does he have to pay taxes on that? 
Uh, that would be something they'd have to go back and pull up the documentation on from the GI Bill. Okay. They would spe they should specifically address that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Again, the go with this, what we're trying to do. The concept of if somebody gave you a form, you have a right to go back and ask about that form. Okay. And Arissa asks, uh, this is again about the 1098T. If you were to take box five and subtract that from box one, the leftover negative balance is taxable income. Well, actually, that in theory, I'd say that's probably very close to a ballpark number. Mm -hmm. But if, again, the form's not used for that. Gotcha. So the IRS doesn't use the negative and then go over to your tax return and see if that number was transferred. Um, uh, right now, they don't anyway. Um, basically, uh, it's a good rule of thumb to say, well, wait a minute, that must represent my stipends because box one is your tuition. And box five is your tuition and stipend. So maybe be the stipends. But again, that number could even be reduced by the fact that you say, well, wait a minute. I used a lot of this as part of the curriculum. I bought a laptop, I bought some books, and all of it was required. Uh, and that could work, and that could reduce it. Cool. Thank you, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about like qualified educational expenses in, 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 a, in a few moments, right? Because I'm getting questions about that too. <laughs> um, well, I will go through and see how we can back to that. Uh, this isn't really about 1098 T's though, so. No, I got you, yeah, no, I got that's you. Fine. So right. now we're into what I think is very important because it takes us from what's taxable, which is right, the scholarships and fellowships. And it's gonna talk about how we put it on the tax return. Again, this is a tax return from January uh, uh, to December. And it includes, it's a bucket. Everything that happened in that bucket, if you earned interest, that gets included with your scholarship. If you got paid a dividends, that gets included um, and so forth. So that's basically how it works. There's a filing threshold though. So to the extent your stipend was less than $12,000, you can see there's a standard here. If you're single, you get an automatic deduction of 12,200. That means if you don't have anything else, interest, dividends or anything else, you only have $12,000, you're, you're gonna put that on the return. You're gonna end up with 200, a negative $200. Now it's a deduction. It doesn't get you a net operating loss. It's a standard deduction. Let's think of it as non-refundable. But the bottom line is you don't owe any taxes. You don't have any taxable income. Your taxable income has to exceed 12,200 for the calendar year that we're talking about, if you're single, uh, for you to even have taxable income. So that's one of the deductions you get. So when we went back to that slide, you had the 50, you get $12,200 automatically just for breathing, whether you're a good person, a bad person, uh, whether you had a good year, bad year, it doesn't matter. Uh, now there is an exception as we go through here for dependents and you have to figure out if you're dependent and that would matter for some of the income that's in excess of the scholarship. Do know that they treat scholarships as part of the, uh, the earned income only for determining the standard deduction. So whether you're a dependent or not, you get the full 12,200 if the amount of the um, uh, taxable income that you receive was 12,200 or in excess of that. So you do get that deduction. And some people say, well, why file then? I got 12,000. I have uh, a deduction of 12,200, why do it? Well, it, the 12,000 may have been wages, uh, let's say from Wendy's, and Wendy's as a W-2, issued you W-2 as an employer, they withheld taxes on you, so you wanna file the taxes to get a refund. Yeah, and they owe you, because they, you shouldn't have to pay any tax on the first $12,200, so that's how that works. So you may wanna be filing return even when you don't owe a tax loan. This will walk you through whether you're a dependent or not, uh, typically, uh, although some subjective standards, um, basically you have two, two classifications, child and relative, and to be a qualifying child, uh, the one objective standard is your age. If you're uh, 24 years of, of age or older, anytime during the calendar year, you're not gonna be a qualifying child. Now, if you fail that, you could be a qualifying relative, and then the question is, did you exceed the 4,200 of, of prong three, the criteria on earned income, and in this case, gross income does include your taxable scholarship. So to that extent, then you most likely, if you fail A, you tend to fail B. If you fail as a qualifying child, you tend to fail as a qualifying relative. But that's all depending upon your age and how much money you got in scholarship, uh, the taxable scholarships. Um, but then that's where you gotta go and call your parents. What did you do on the tax return? Are you take his, the dependent is, that's who's gonna take you, your parents. So you call up and ask, are you guys taking me on your tax return now? Bottom line. That's how it works. Um, but it won't make a lot of difference, though, because you'll really get the $12,200 up to the extent of your qualified scholarship. So let's go to our first case study. 
We've got a graduate student, they're single, and I've been working with the single bracket. 14,250, which is in excess of the 12,200. So we have to figure out, we have, is it taxable income? And yes, all of the scholarship fund is absent or uh, less the tuition. So yes, we do have taxable income. We could be a dependent. So how would that look? Here's the first page of the 1040. Here's what it looks like, guys. And you'll see the, uh, the single up there under filing status, the name Jane Doe, I made up the social security number. And then we get the standard deduction and I put you in as a dependent. Now, I can go to the next slide. It's the same slide, except you can see where it says standard deduction. You're no longer checked as a dependent. So you either are or aren't. And the point here is in the comparison, what's the difference if I'm a dependent or not? There is no difference. You basically have 14,250 you have to report. Now, this is important because you have no other income, just the scholarship, and it's taxable scholarship. You subtract out the 12,200, you end up with 2,050, at a 10% bracket, it's $206. That's how it works. That's how the tax return works, and that's what we talked about. Revenues, less expenses, or deductions. Taxable income, times the tax. You don't have any credit in this case, so you have the $206 that you have to pay. Uh, interestingly, you don't have to pay this on a quarterly basis because it's under $1,000. That's what's important. Uh, and we'll get to that when we get to the quarterly estimated tax return. Uh, here's another case study. Two different scenarios. One, someone gets a grant award of $15,000 to do research, and they use it for rent and, and living expenses. That's the purpose. Sounds taxable to me. And the other one, you've got $25,000 of a grant. 9,000 covers tuition. 1,000 covers the books for curriculum that are required for the curriculum. And 15,000 for rent and living expenses. So in scenario A, 15,000 sounds like taxable income. What's the taxable income in the alternative? It's 15,000. We talked about tuition being excluded because it's for tuition. And the $1,000 expenses would be excluded because it's required for the curriculum. So even though you got a $16,000 cash stipend, only 15 of it's taxable because 1,000 went to the books that were required. So what's it look like on the return? Well, you've seen this page. Now we go to the next page, 15,000. I get my 12,200 deduction. I got 2,800 and I owe $281. That's the same for both answers. And what's interesting is, in this case, that um, you don't, again, estimated taxes, you won't have that to worry about, but also you're not seeing the math. I'm not bringing in 25, less nine, less one to get to 15. I'm not doing that. You'd, all the IRS wants to know is what's your tax. That's it, put it on, then you're done. Quarterly estimated tax payments. This is the tough part, folks. You go through that slide and you end up owing more than $1,000, you're gonna to have to pay that in throughout the year, basically in four quarters. This year's a little odd because the uh, two quarters have been merged, so there's only three quarters this year. But this year's been that way. That makes total sense based on COVID. Um, but you have to figure that out. A lot of times it's a, it's a case of cash flow management as well. You may just wanna pay it right away. Your first quarter payment for the 2020 will be due pretty much the same time you're filing your annual return for the 2019 year. Again, 2019 year return is due in April 15th. Then your first quarter payment for 2020 is due April 15th. Now, just to keep in mind, that's one way to, keep, to, to, to actually um, uh, keep the concepts separate, but then understand how they apply together. Um, so let's go back. One thing I mentioned is when you have a tax return, you're doing quarterly estimated tax payments, What's, what am I filing next April? Next April is a way of saying, here's what happened last year. But you basically have to have paid in 90% of last year during the year. Now, when you work for an employer, they do that for you. But if you don't, then you're going to have to have done that on a quarterly basis. And then when you get to April, really, you're just reconciling. So I paid in 100. I actually owe 110. Here's your $10. That's all, that's all you're doing in April. The real work is being done as you go through the year. Remember? Pay as you go. That was one of the concepts. Um, and you have to do your quarterlies as you go. Quarters are April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January. Um, what's interesting here too is it's not even like three every three months. Uh, it's three and a half, two and a half, three and a half, and then four and a half. It's just the way it works. Um, um, there is also estimated tax payments at the state level. Um, and then for, uh, at least in Michigan, 
um, it's where you're going to be over $11,765 worth of taxable income. I will say I've never heard of the state coming back and asking for estimated tax payments, whereas the Fed will ask regularly. In fact, incorrectly. Many times they'll come back and ask for it. And you say, I paid it in. And they go, oh, sorry, just checked it. So do keep in mind. Um, and then, of course, here's the form, the 1040 ES. Now, you can also do this electronically. Um, but there is a form, and it's very helpful. It's supposed to get you through this. Payment voucher for due January 15th, 2020. Here's a record that you can keep in mind to keep you uh, on track, current, um, for many people who uh, you know, don't like accounting. The best way to do this, you just ballpark what you think your amount's going to be. Now, if you're going to get the same stipend this year you got last year, you use last year's, throw that up there. You get your deduction. Now, in this case, it only shows the 12,000, but it'd be 12,200. If they increase it for 2020, it'd be 12,400 or whatever the increase is. And then you come up with your income like you normally do. You take 90% of it, that's all you have to file, and you divide it by four. You can also turn around and say, I just want to pay in the whole 1802 in the very first quarter. Uh, you can pay earlier, you don't want to pay later, you'll get hit with a penalty. Um, but that's how it works. Uh, a lot of times people don't get paid quarterly, they get paid uh, semi-annually, then you only need to do two uh, in the two quarters that it falls. So that's basically how it works. And I always like to annualize it, make it look like an actual full year return, understanding what I'm gonna have, then I get the full uh, deductions, and then I come up with whatever my tax liability is. But you're really just working with what you think your tax liability is. You can do it on the back of a napkin if you like. Um, uh, and particularly when it's low enough, it's just a 10% tax break. Ed, quick question on that. Sure. Um, just a quick, Eric asks, can I do additional withholding instead of making quarterly payments? That's a great question. I hope everybody understood that. Um, what that really is, is allowing you to do your, how do you want to manage that? That means somebody, whether you're married and they're working, uh, your spouse, or you've got another job and you have an employer doing withholdings. You can go to your employer and say, I want you to withhold over withhold. And that way it'll cover some of my tax payments that I'd have to make on my own for my scholarship. All the IRS cares is that it gets paid in. They don't care by who. So if your employer pays in your amount of tax for the services you're doing for them and the tax for what you're incurring with respect to the scholarship, that's fine. Uh, the employer is going to do what you tell them to do. You do that on W-4 and they go ahead and make the adjustments. And you, it may be where you don't even get any cash because there's just enough to cover both. But bottom line is you can avoid quarterly payments by working with either your own situation or your spouse's situation, if you file jointly, where you actually have uh, uh, access to an employer who can do withholding on your behalf. Um, so to get back, to, so that's a great question. So you do wanna be able to manage your correlation with tax payments. It doesn't have to tie exactly to the amount. They, at the end, the IRS just wants your money. They don't care how you get it there. And again, that's why you can pay it in all that early. They don't really care. They want your money as much as they can. You're not going to get any interest on it, so it's just to their benefit. So they're willing to take it. Um, penalties, uh, the Internal Revenue Code is like the worst parent in the world. They don't do anything appropriately in the sense that there's no positive reinforcement, anything along these lines. And if you do anything wrong, they will tell you by penalizing. Uh, and that's what happens here. So basically, if you don't pay in 90% of the current year's amount, 100% of the prior year tax, so if your stipend goes up, you may really just have to pay in last year's. Uh, tax, um, you may have to have um, be subject to penalties. And again, if you're under $1,000, they're not going to subject you anything. There's no, uh, don't take offense at this, but bottom line is there's more cost in the paperwork of telling you what you owe and then you actually owing it and then them coming back and hitting you with a penalty for it. It just doesn't make any sense. So basically, they let it go for that. Uh, as a, think of it as an administrative threshold. Um, but there are penalties, and uh, you don't want to be on the list because once you get on a the list, they like you on that list. So you have to do a lot to get off that list. So try to avoid your underpayment penalties. Ed, um, good question because you're talking about penalties and stuff. So good question here from uh, Michael in the box. He just wants to clarify when after the current tax deadline, which is July 15th, when would the next round of estimated taxes be due? September 15th. September 15th. Thank you. I'm going to put that in the box. Thanks, Ed. And then January 15th. Yeah, it's on the one slide that we went through. Yep. Uh, it's got the quarterlies. And, um, and that doesn't change. Yep. The only reason it may change is if the 15th falls on a Saturday or Sunday, you get to go to the next working day that Monday. 
Uh, and again, you can do these online. Uh, you just always want to make sure you keep uh, proof that you paid it because again, they can come back from time to time and say, we never received it, which particularly in a COVID, they've been under a lot of stress. And I think the IRS has done extremely well under COVID. Um, but just the same, they may feel they've lost it and uh, it's up to you to make sure you, you paid it. So. so now we're dealing with, uh, 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 I think we're up to multi-state. Um, this is just a Dave Barry joke. I find it very funny. Uh, I am funny uh, with my jokes. Um, they don't, no matter how funny they are, they're less funny the further along we go. So anyway, uh, just seems to be. Uh, but just the same. Uh, in this case, now we're talking about state filing requirements. We tend to get a lot of questions on this. Um, with states, you got to keep in mind that there are you're paying to the state tax on the same dollar you earned that you paid to the federal government. So there is double taxation between Fed and state. However, there shouldn't be double taxation between states. So how can that arise? Well, first, every state um, basically has to determine whether it wants a tax regime. There are some states that don't have an income tax regime, Tennessee, Florida. So if you're from those states, you may want to think differently about how to handle this than you would otherwise. Um, and then most states that actually have a state uh, income tax regime uh, follow pretty much the Fed. And in this case, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know of any states that have any differences between what we've talked about with the Fed on scholarships and fellowships. Uh, they define NRAs the same and so forth, so I'm not seeing any difference. Um, where it gets tricky, so now basically where you're from is really the, the question, what state are you from? If you're a US citizen or resident alien, you have a home state. You're a resident of that state. What state is it? Um, and multi-state becomes an issue because if that's not Michigan, then you basically have two states. You're earning scholarships and fellowships in the state of Michigan. Um, but your home state's going to want to tax you on those scholarships and fellowships because worldwide income, just like the Fed, they're going to tax you on your worldwide income. They don't care where you earned it. Um, your concern may be double taxation, but it won't be and because there is a credit form that allows you to offset what you paid to one state to the other. There is a gap, and this is where the strategy comes in. If the state, your home state, has a higher tax rate than Michigan's, then there may be a situation where you're paying more tax in overall than you would be uh, if you only filed with Michigan. And basically, that's where people then agree uh, to want to or opt to want to change their residency from their home state to Michigan. Uh, so again, you can find that situation. That situation arises where your home state has an income tax regime, not, not Florida. If you're from Florida. This isn't your concern. And it's higher than Michigan, which is 4.2%. And that's a flat rate. Uh, we don't have a progressive rate. So then you want to go back to your home state and determine if you're actually having a higher rate. And we have an example in here with South Carolina is at 5.5%. And it's just a smaller percentage. It doesn't seem like much. You'll find out how much more money you're actually paying in tax because you're paying more to South Carolina than you would be if you changed your residency to Michigan. And we'll go through that. So something to consider. Changing residency, as you can see, is based on intent. There's nothing more than that. You can change your residency this year and go back to South Carolina if you like for the next year. Um, changing residency, uh, it's like walking a plank. Uh, the more uh, documentation you have, the safer you're off that plank. So if you have a driver's license in Michigan, then that works. Um, if you uh, have a voter registration in Michigan, that helps. If you have your um, uh, address in your name, the lease in your name, then that will help. Um, but basically, these are documents that help prove that you are a resident of Michigan. Uh, you'll find uh, Michigan has a very active website. Uh, it's very conservative. Um, uh, it's, not, it's very tough for students, actually. But if you read through it, um, uh, you can get a sense of what they're getting at. Um, in fact, any of the publications, even the IRS publications, are written uh, in favor of the IRS. They wrote them. Uh, that's not necessarily that they give you a rule, and that's not necessarily the full aspect of the rule. There's some planning with that, but you wouldn't know that with the way they wrote it. You're only going to know that if you pull up a CCH, uh, which is a Commerce Clearinghouse booklet, um, or any of these tax booklets, TurboTax, anything like that, will help you to get through that and understand what you have and what you don't have. But don't expect these publications to help you with your planning. They won't. They're just trying to collect money. Um, the publications that will help you will be, again, CCH Master Tax Guide or TurboTax or something along those lines. 
But again, the double taxation, it's because it's based on cash is really where the issue comes up. And California is always the case. They have the highest tax rate, 13.5 or something like that. Uh, Michigan's 4.2%. So when you get to the 13.5% bracket, um, basically, uh, California is going to tax you on 13.5 less the 4.2% that you paid to Michigan. Uh, where if you change your residency, you would only be paying the 4.2% to Michigan. You wouldn't have to pay California because you change your residency. So they don't get that extra money, you get the extra savings. That's the strategy. Uh, now, Michigan state tax return has some issues. Uh, basically, it's very straightforward, and we'll go through an example, but they do have a homestead exemption credit that, doesn't, uh, that applies broadly to more than just the homeowners. It applies to leaseholders as well. Uh, so if you've been in the state, or more than six months or more, you might be entitled to it. Interestingly, it's a refundable credit. So that's the good news. So you may want to look into that to see if you're entitled to it. So here we have a case study, $8,000. We're not talking about a lot of money. No other income. I try to make it very simple. That's not necessarily the case. The student's not claimed as a dependent by another taxpayer. So they're, they're what we call independent. And the student is a resident of Michigan and qualifies for the homestead exemption. So how does that look? Well, here's a Michigan tax return. You can see name, number, and so forth. And you see line eight, 2019 residency status, residence, you check that box. If you want to be a resident of California, you would check non-resident. And if you switch to residency during the year, you would check part year. It's very important. You can see you get an exemption amount, which is very much like the standard deduction, the 12,200. But in this case, it's 4,400. And you subtract that from the 8,000, because that's a deduction against revenues. And you end up with 3,625 at a 4.2% to 5% tax rate, you come up with $154 of tax. That's what you owe to the state of Michigan. Now, it's small enough, I don't think you have to do it on a quarterly basis. When you come down, the second page, you start with the tax, and then you come down to line 25, and they say property tax credit, and you actually have the homestead credit, $425, which is more than 154, which is why you're getting back $271. The state will give you money. That's the refundable credit. Uh, the homestead credit. So you want to see if you if you can qualify. Here is the form. You'll have to attach a form, which explains to them how it works. And you talk about your salary. You talk about the amount of um, rent that you're paying. Um, uh, the second page, uh, well, they want to know about wage uh, or income thresholds and phase outs and so forth. But at the end of the day, you can see from the calculation, you're at $425. Ed, does the uh, homestead, homestead credit have to be for a homeowner or is homestead more about your, 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 where you live permanently? It can be for uh, uh, leaseholders as well, tenants. Okay. Uh, the idea is in rent, you're paying the property tax. That's what the landlord does. They stick the property tax into the lease rate of the payment. Gotcha. So in which case, you should be entitled to it. Not all states take that rationale, but Michigan does. That's why it works for students. I do recommend you check the webpage at the Michigan Department of Revenue because they're very particular about that, um, about students. There's a lot of students. Again, it's written very pro-state, but at the same time, it will give you guidance as to exact details. If you qualify under their standard, you clearly qualify. Um, so you've got a sense for, now we go to multi-state. We've talked some about this. You've got the non-resident or part year. Non-resident is you don't want to change your residency. And I wouldn't if I was in Florida. I'm not paying any tax. That way, all I'm paying to Michigan is 4.25% on my scholarship amount, no more. Um, if I had interest, dividends, or any other kind of money that I obviously earned out of the state of Michigan, Michigan can't tax that. And Florida, as my home residency, isn't going to either. So I'm in my best scenario if I don't change my residency. Um, um, and contrary, if I'm from California, which has a higher tax rate than Michigan, and I have interest or dividends or any other kind of money that I'm earning outside the state of Michigan, I'm gonna switch my residency. Now, I don't want to be a California resident because I have to pay at a higher tax bracket. When if I switch to Michigan, I'm in a lower tax bracket. And we talked about how to do that through intent and documentation. Now, how to do that? Well, pre pretty much in the first year, it's a part year term. Um, part of the year you're in California, part of the year you're here, unless you start in the winter term. Um, and then you file a tax return to California based on the taxes that you or the taxable income that you have earned during that period. And then you file with Michigan for that. So you're filing two separate returns, but really for one year. One's for a portion of the year and the, other, and the other return for the rest of the year. That's how that works. Non-resident is where you've changed your residence. So in the second year, you could file one tax return and it would be for Michigan. You don't have to worry about filing for California because you're no longer a resident of California. 
and you're only going to be taxed on the Michigan return. So we have a case study, $30,000. That's your tuition and stipends. That's the Michigan money. Then you have $70 of interest income. That's South Carolina money as of right now. So before you go into the calendar year, you go, oh, I think I want to change. California's at 5%, Michigan's at 4.25. We're talking about 0.75%, not even a complete percentage difference. Does it matter? Is it worth it all? Well, one, you'd only have to file one tax return in Michigan if you change. Two, I think it's going to save you some money. So here's what Michigan looks like. And again, we've seen the 4,400, the 30,070. You, you put all that in there. Turns out the 70 comes out because up on box 8B, you have non-resident. So there you want to say, and you, you attach a schedule one, and you say the $70 belongs with another state. And Michigan goes, okay, so we're just going to be taxing you on the 30,000, the stipend and tuition that you received in the state of Michigan. And you say, yes. So you subtract out the 4,400, you end up with 25,6. You have 1,088. That's your tax. You bring that over. We're not doing the credit here at this point in time. So that's what you owe, 1,088. Now you move over. This is the schedule you want to show them. Again, line 4A is non-resident. You look through here, you've got 30,000 plus the 70 is 30,070, but Michigan only gets 30 and other state gets 70. So South Carolina theoretically is only getting $70 of taxable income. Okay, so let's go to the South Carolina return. Uh, name, number, so forth. You get your exemption amount, actually pretty generous. So you have your 30,070. Why is it 30? I thought the, the schedule for Michigan said 70, but it's a home state and they're gonna tax you on your worldwide income. And you go, but that's double taxation, but they're gonna give you a credit. And that's what we're going through. So 30,070 less the 4,000, 190 gets you 25. I owe 1,294. Wow, I just a little over, just under 2,000 in Michigan and now I owe this, this is high. Where's this credit coming in? Okay, well there's your 1,088. So the difference is 206. So folks, in a sense, because you didn't change your residency from South Carolina, on the $70, you ended up paying an additional $206 in taxes. So again, and it's just a 0.75% of a difference. So my, my, my thought is you may wanna question your home state, whether you have a tax uh, income regime, and if you do, whether the rate's higher than Michigan's. And if that's the case, whether you want to change, that's it. That's your residency issue. Um, so we do have a chart here to go through just to give you some comfort. Um, and the, just a couple questions. Will I have taxable income? Most assuredly. Uh, if I were your tax person, I'd tell you to prepare for it. So it's substantially um, this income covered by wages. Uh, you were a GSRA in the beginning of the year for a couple months, and then you received a scholarship for nine months of the year? Probably not. In which case, we got to go to step three. Do any of the exceptions apply? Yeah, it turns out I'm under $1,000. I don't have to do quarterly estimated tax payment. Turns out it's more than I'm going to have to do. look at paying in quarterly estimated tax payment. Um, then step four, uh, with payments, you get to manage it. That was one of Paul's questions. Do, uh, how do I do this? You can pay it all up front. You can pay it all one quarter. You don't have to go through all four quarters. Just pay it in the first, get it done, you're over with. Then I don't have to worry about it. A lot of opportunities there. Um, and then of course, keep in mind step five is really just a reconciliation when you file that April 15th or that return on April 15th. Basically, somebody should have been doing a withhold or you should have been doing quarterly estimated tax payments throughout the calendar year. In which case, next April, when you go to file the return, you just explain to the IRS how the payment structure went and whether you get some back or you owe a little. Uh, that's the idea and that's the concept. Paul, do you have any other questions? At the... I have a couple of questions here. Um, let me go through through them here. Uh, so one question, if I receive my first stipend payment in August, do I begin paying quarterly estimated taxes in September? So some taxes, some people still asking about uh, the quarterly filing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, your first quarter is January to March. Uh, and then it's um, April and May for June 15th. Uh, and then it's going to be June and July and August for September 15th. So yes, yes, I think September 15th would be your first quarter due. And that would be for this year as well. So this year, your first quarter is July 15th. And then you get paid in August. You don't have to worry about July. And nothing happened there. But if you get paid in August, then yes, September 15th still is. So nothing's changed. Those two quarter payments are still out there this year. 
September 15th and January 15th because, because they haven't changed. COVID hasn't picked them up. And the IRS hasn't extended, and I don't think they're going to extend that. They want their money now. So at that point. One more quick question. Uh, I'll, I'll sum it up as basically where someone's worked and in, made income in three different states. Do they file in each set state separately, or how does that work? That's great. I think a lot of that comes down to more facts and circumstances than we have. But yeah. conceptually, yeah, first, what's your home state? Uh, and it may not be any of those three states. You may have four. But generally, you have to file in your home state if it has a tax income regime. And then the other three states, you'd have to see if they have income tax regime. If you worked in Orlando, Florida, you're not going to have to worry. But to the extent you did, theoretically, what's happened is the employers in those states have withheld state income tax for that state. So you're going to want to file anyway to get it back, even if you're not entitled, if you're entitled to a refund, even if you don't owe a tax. But uh, just the same, yeah, if you owe a tax, that state's definitely going to look for it. So you're going to need to file in those states. Um, that tends to have, we see that when for certain uh, students who come in uh, as, a, as a first year student here, as a first year graduate student, because they've worked in various states. So, yeah, you gotta, you're going to have to work through that, uh, that tax returns as you go. All right. Now, what I have is the last page, just to, before we sign off. These are some of the publications. Uh, 970 is what we talked about. Uh, again, it's written by the IRS for the IRS. But uh, a lot of this is stuff to give you some guidance of what we talked about. Again, the ripple effect. Uh, publication 17 is very helpful just for the broader, the bigger picture, tax returns. Uh, if you have withholding or estimated tax questions, and again, all of these include illustrations, you've got publication 505. Um, and then um, non-resident aliens, there is publication 515. So they're still out there. They're very active. And uh, um, the, you know, the, I think they're helpful. Just keep in mind they're written by the IRS. Because there's always plan tax planning. That's, you know, we, we're a little bit, uh, there's every word is a legal term and there's a definition, a slew of court cases that define each word. So there's always going to be planning. But overall, the IRS will give you the bare facts. And uh, if you meet the IRS test and can still qualify, then clearly you're not going to have a problem. Hey, I've gotten a couple of questions here on, uh, sorry, on um, basically like, uh, what counts as an educational expense and what counts as, um, so for, for expenses that are untaxable income, do, do students need to support uh, the claim with receipts and things? Can you just, I know it's, we're running out of time, but can you just sort of speak to that broadly? Well, I can say if you spend anything that's required for the curriculum and you're not going to then include uh, that stipend amount on the tax return, you're gonna need to be able to prove that that's exactly what it was. So it's substantiation and uh, you're going to need a receipt. And a lot of times students move, so they put it in a shoebox and they carry it with them. Put it on your laptop, make sure you keep that if you want and go forward. But IRS officials, when they audit you, it's always two years after the fact, they're going to sit down and say, yeah, well, how come you didn't put that thousand dollars on that based on our case study on the return? You say, well, I spent it on books that required part of the curriculum. Prove to me they were required. Well, here's the email. And then prove to me you bought them. Well, here's the receipts. So yeah, re re you do have to keep a receding aspect in mind as you go through this. You have to look at it from a, you know, a, an IRS perspective who's always, always asking the question, show me. So. Cool, all right. Well, I think we're out of time. So um, I do wanna take a moment and say thanks to everybody. I appreciate you letting me bore you to death for about an hour on taxes. Paul, thanks for setting this up and facilitating this. Thanks, Ed. Um, and like I said, we, we will be doing different, uh, you know, we, re we revisit taxes a few times a year at uh, here at Rackham and the recording. So please come back as, 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 as you have questions, there's things happen, come back and we, we can answer some of these questions. But uh, also uh, a recording of this will be available uh, for everybody uh, in the next few days and we will email everybody as well. And before you leave, I will put the slides in the chat box one more time so you can take a look at the slides as well. Uh, Ed, thanks, always a pleasure. Thanks folks, I appreciate it. Have a good one folks. Take care.